Well, good morning. How you doing? All right, and welcome to those of you worshiping with us uh, at uh, East Paris uh, campus at Kentwood and Knapp Street. I'm so pleased we get to join together for this uh, a third installment of this series uh, called uh, Faith That uh, Works from New Testament writings of a book called uh, James, a letter called James. And it's good to be back home. I was outbound for a little bit of uh, filming in uh, Israel for our fall series. We're doing a 12-part fall series called uh, Doubter's Guide to Jesus post-Labor Day and filmed 12 different segments, one to go with each. Uh, message. So uh, back safe and sound from Israel. And can you do something? Can you thank uh, Brad Holmes and Bob King for opening the scriptures the last two weeks for us? So, so, so grateful for uh, Brad and Bob uh, to jump in. And this is a special day for me. Uh, 35 years ago today, I was married. 35th wedding anniversary today. Now, I know it's not like, I know it's not like, you know, 40 or 50 or something like that, but 35 is still kind of one of those uh, mile markers. Would you, would you like to see a picture? Uh, oh, look at that. Look at that hair. Yeah, something. <laughs> I'm looking at that. Did I use a blow dryer in those days? I hope not. And so uh, someone said, oh man, don't you wish you were 21 again? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm very comfortable being right where I am. And uh, months, uh, just months after Chris and I were, were married, uh, we started at Ada Bible Church, not as like pastor and wife, but just uh, filling in uh, weekends to speak weekends. So, uh, so 35 years of marriage and 35 uh, years uh, in, in church ministry and a pastoral responsibility. And uh, the 35 years has uh, given me a platform from which to make an observation. And the observation I have is that the grace of Jesus radically changes people's lives. Uh, in our time here, we have seen people break away from addictions and from addictive patterns that have kept them in chains for years. And they would attribute the grace of Jesus in their lives of helping them break free from addictive patterns. We've seen that. We've seen individuals who their biggest interest in life, their biggest obsession and motivation was the next purchase, the next purchase, the next purchase, totally consumed in consumer lifestyle, materialism, consumer debt. Over time, break free from that and become wildly generous. Wildly generous. It's the power of Christ to move in our hearts and to change us, and we've seen that. We've seen families open their homes where they thought they were done having kids and then they did an adoption, either from the States or an international adoption, just because they believed that there might be some children out there that needed to be raised in a loving, loving environment, care-filled environment. We've seen others that have opened their doors on a long-term basis to taking a niece or a nephew or a grandchild when a parent reached a point where they were incapable of offering care to that child. Now, this is joy-filled and it is a blessing, but it is neither convenient or comfortable. It's disruptive. We've seen that. The grace of God radically affects the way people view their, 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 their time. We've seen individual cultivate speech patterns where they begin to use their words to give encouragement and to give comfort, learning the, the power of words to intersect with other people's lives in moments of, of need, people that just need to be lifted or they need a word of comfort. They need to be reminded that God has not forgotten them. In 35 years, again and again and again, we've seen the transformation of people's hearts in a way that affects their words and their conversational patterns. 35 years, I would say, with a resounding note, Jesus Christ is powerful to radically change people's lives, and that's the truth. That's some of the truth. Some of the truth is also that we see people not change year after year, after year, after year. It, we've seen people wallow in an addiction while attending church, while believing in Jesus, while listening to sermons and singing worship songs and not reach out for the help that they could have reached out for. We've seen that. 
We've, we've seen individuals continue to spiral into consumer debt, buying things they don't need with money they don't have, trying to fill a spiritual vacuum with material stuff and kind of not breaking free from that. We've seen that a lot. We've not only seen people open their homes, we've, we've seen a lot of fractured families that simply didn't need to happen. Someone bails on a spouse and young kids because they get bored. Or they, I think I'll be happier over there. We're, we're, we're talking church people here who understand the grace of Christ and know Jesus as their rescuer make, in my estimation, pretty pretty bad decisions on a family level. We've seen that. And we've seen not only individuals use their words to encourage and to comfort, we've had our share of opportunities to witness individuals be petty and picky and demeaning and condescending or even malicious and slanderous in their words. Jesus makes all the difference in the world, sometimes. Does this never trouble you? Does this never cross your mind? When you go, how can the power of Christ make such a massive difference in this person's life over here? And how can the message of Jesus, we're talking about churched people here, make like almost zero difference in this person's life over here? What's up with this? And some of you are thinking, well, Jeff, it's, it's the nature of American Christianity. American Christianity is a consumer oriented and can be lethargic and mediocre. I really don't think that's it. Because as I open the New Testament of my Bible and I see the first generations of, Christ, of Christians, it seems to me like there was a challenge even back then, right out of the gate, in whether or not Jesus was really making a difference in somebody's life. Uh, consider with me these two statements written by James, the author in the, the first century. He's writing to a Jesus community here or a group of Jesus communities, and he says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. What, last four words, say them out loud, what did he say? Do what it says. So apparently there was a type of connection to Christ that was active and moving and vital. And there was a type of connection to Christ where teaching just kind of landed and just sat there ineffectively. Uh, this next statement here from the same chapter, and both of these are in the section that we get to look at this morning. It says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is what? Last word. Their religion is worthless. Uh, so this, yeah, it's probably American Christianity. No, no, right out of the gate, there was this possibility to have a connection to Jesus and a connection to spiritual truth in a way that was absolutely life transforming and also a way to have a connection to Jesus where the religion was, what's that word at the end? Worthless, just, just as worthless, right out of the gate. Now, uh, James uh, is, as I understand it, is writing to not just Christians, not just believers, he's writing to Jewish Christians. And the distinction there is that many of these people, by and large, before they came to know Jesus, they were raised with what we would call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. They, they, they were raised with the Ten Commandments. They were raised with the, the Bible stories of uh, Moses and Abraham and, and King David. T to put it in our phraseology today, these people were raised in church. But then in addition to knowledge of the Old Testament, these people had come in contact with uh, the generous God who enters the planet through the person of Jesus, who generously gives up his life for us on a Roman cross, they had come to know Jesus as their rescuer. Just put that together. They're raised with the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures. They've come to know Jesus as their rescuer, as the one who forgives. And James, from a pastor's heart, just says, don't just hear the stuff, man, put it into practice. I mean, the person that, that thinks they're religion, religious and doesn't control their speech is that they're self-deceived and the religion is worthless. Uh, my dear friends, I think in this section of James that we're gonna look at today, some of us are gonna get a major clue 
into why some people change and some people don't. People who attend the same church and listen to the same sermons. My plea for you today as we go through this material is please hear this for you. As we're walking through the material today, there will be a possibility to go, oh man, and you think of someone at work. Don't do that. You might be thinking of your husband. You might be thinking of your wife. You might be thinking of your ex-husband. You might be thinking of your ex-wife. You might be thinking of someone in your small group that just the same year after year after year that won't deal with the things they need to deal with. I would plead with you not to think on your, of your son or daughter or someone in your church or someone in your former church. I would plead with you to receive this for you. And if you are moving, if you're steadily moving forward, I hope that the words today from this section are just kind of like, man, baby, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And if you're stuck and if you're stagnant, may the the, the, the water of today's scripture provide just a new stream in your life. And I plead with you to hear this conversation for you. And James unpacks this conversation about why people change and why people don't. He unpacks it in three parts. So three-part conversation today. And part number one is just uh, called how we relate. Part number one is about how we relate. Fasten your seatbelt. James chapter one, verse 19, here we go. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You say, well, that's about speech. Well, it's not. It, it's about speech, but it's really about relationships. Because as goes the conversation, so goes the relationship. As goes the conversation, so goes the relationship. And so James is writing to believers with Jewish background, he's saying, listen, each of you, each of you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. A couple things. He says, oh, my dear brothers and sisters, it's a tender approach. He's not just reaming them out. My dear brothers and sisters, he's writing, but yet he's saying, listen, understand something. I love you. I love you a lot. But there's something we got to talk about here. And then each of you, everyone, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. It's like, this isn't just for preachers. This isn't just for Sunday school teachers. Uh, this isn't just for the, the, the spiritually mature. As he's looking at the community, he says, listen, this is for every person hearing this, every person reading this. Everyone, uh, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. So let's look at these three. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Show of hands. How many dudes, men in the room, over the age of 40, you look at that list, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and just kind of going like, Mannion, if I had nailed that in my 20s and 30s, things would have gone a whole lot better. Show of hands, please. All right, there we go. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. I know what you're asking. You're asking for equal time. You want me to ask how many women over 40? See, there's a problem there. And it's not having them confess that they're short-tempered, it's having them confess that they're over 40. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm quick to listen. See, there we go, there we go. So, uh, uh, women over <clears throat> 33. How many go, okay, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. If I had nailed that in my 20s and early 30s, things might have gone differently. Sarah, show of hands, show of hands. This is huge, this is huge. I'm, 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 I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if an individual just took those, if a church person just took those three sentences, those three statements, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and worked on that, and worked on that, and worked on that, and worked on that, you could be a radically different person in the way you relate at work, in the way you relate with family, in the way that you relate at church, quick. It's about speed. Quick, slow, slow. Quick, slow, slow. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And slow to anger, what's up with that? Slow to anger, uh, quick, to, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, the, next, the, the next verse down gives kind of the why behind that slow to anger thing. And it says, uh, because human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Now, my rage does a bunch of things. My rage can dominate. 
My rage can intimidate and my rage can bring a conversation to an abrupt stop. There's something that my rage does not do. Generally speaking, my rage does not bring about the goodness that God desires from my life. He says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You will not become the person that God created you to be with run away anger, with run away rage. So it is quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, it, so, something we, we've talked about before, and it, it's worth, worth mentioning again because it, it's been a while. Uh, you're driving down the road and you're thinking about something and you're thinking about something other than driving. And accidentally, inadvertently, you kind of pull in a little too close in the car behind you. You cut somebody off. And they honk. Not the beep, beep, just want you to know I'm here honk, but the punitive honk. The 37 second, you've just destroyed my life. How dare you suck air on planet Earth honk. And sometimes the car pulls out and it goes by. And if you glance over, there's the red face, the popping vein, the flying hands, the flying fingers. And you need to know something. You didn't make that person angry. They already were angry. You just provided an opportunity for them to express their anger. You just need to know something. You didn't make that person angry. They already were angry. If we got like a 10 scale here, and 10 is that number at which we blow a fuse, at which we blow a gasket, that person was driving around at about a 9.5. And all it took was this little push to send them over the edge. You didn't make that person angry. They were angry. Okay, that's the driver. Um, dads. Dads, you got to give your kids more than two points. If you're walking around at an eight and you blow a gasket at a 10, you blow a fuse at a 10, it's just this little something that sends you, how many times do I, uh, you got to give your kids more than two points. This is part and parcel of what it means to be a follower of our Lord. It has to do with how we relate. Each of you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The term we use for a person that's quick to anger is they have a short, they have a short fuse. You light a match, boom, there it goes. Talking about having a long fuse, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Moms. Mom, 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 mom. Quick to listen, slow to speak. What? Slow to anchor. Uh, your kids, your kids need more than two points, Grace. They need more than two points, margin. Uh, whether your children are uh, two or 12 or 32, Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Whether you are in a marriage that's four months old, four years old, or 35 years old, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. See, James, why are you writing this? James, why are you writing this? I think James would say, I am fearful of the Jesus groups getting embroiled in petty, angry argumentation. This isn't just about you and you and you and you and you. This is about you. He's writing to the communities and says, listen. Uh, and so just look at this in a, you know, the family and marriage and kids and the whole thing at work. But uh, church context, um, 
we, we, we have a youth ministry. It's called Lifeline. We have literally dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of volunteers, each, each campus, who work with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. And this children's ministry called Discovery Village. Dozens and dozens and dozens of volunteers who serve our babies and our, our elementary, pre-elementary kids in, uh, in Discovery Village and our children's ministry. Dozens. We have dozens of women that guide other women in our women's ministry. Dozens of men that provide guidance for other men in our men's ministry. Uh, it, it just just goes on and on. My friends, it takes no imagination on my part to see how there can be misunderstandings. Why isn't that better organized? Why is that disorganized? Why was that done that way? It takes no imagination on my part to see how we simultaneously have massive opportunity for impact and influence, and at the same time, massive opportunity for conflict and misunderstanding. Are you with me on this? Man, I'm telling you, when you serve with each other, as you serve people, just, okay, man, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. This is massive in our relationships. That's, that's part one. It's like how we relate. It looks like it's about speech, but as goes, as goes the conversation, so goes the relationship. Uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, Jeff, let me get this right. Those people were raised with the scriptures. By and large, yes. They knew the Bible stories, yes. And then they had come to know that Jesus came and died for them and had forgiven them, yes. And they had anger issues, yes. Those people should have been in church. They were. The question is, what do you do? The question is, what do you do after the sermon? That's part two. Part two of the conversation after the sermon. Uh, pay attention to this uh, next verse. It says, uh, James writes this. He says, do not merely listen. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Last words, please. Last line, what? Do what it says. Now understand what he's saying here is it's possible to walk into a room and to have the scriptures opened and to have them read and to have them taught and to understand it and to walk out and do something. And it is also possible to walk into a room, have the scriptures opened and understand what's being said and walk out and do nothing. That's what James is after here. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. What's that middle sentence, that middle part there? And so deceive yourselves. See, this is the sermon, the sermon and the art of self-deception. The person who walks away without actually doing anything, they're self-deceived because they have confused information with transformation. Ah, I see that. I know that now. I'm good. No, I see that. I know that now. That's not the finish line, baby. That's the starting line. Self-deception in confusing information with transformation. And so James, uh, throughout his uh, writings, he uses these, like, these word images that are so, uh, so interesting. He uses uh, like a, a large ship with a rudder uh, to talk about how our, our speech is, has great, great power to control things. Uh, he talks about uh, a person that's like tossed on the waves and doesn't have any grounding or anchoring point. And here in this conversation, what he uses, he uses the illustration of a mirror. And this is what James says. He says that the person that like listens to scripture taught and then like walks out of the room and like forgets to do anything with it, they're like this. They're like a person that goes and examines himself in a mirror and they check themselves out and say, my goodness, I had more hair when I was 21. But maybe I can do something with it. Maybe there's a pimple that needs uh, attention. And so the person examines himself in the mirror, but it says they turn around and walk away and they immediately forget what they look like. He said, now that, that, that mirror walk away, forget image is what it's like to hear a sermon, to hear scripture taught, to hear it read, to read it and walk away without amending anything. So uh, check out the verse with me. He says, like anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately, what? immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, the word forget is a relatively benign word. He just forgets. 
So say the words with me. Just say, I forgot. Ready? Ready? Play along, please. Ready? I forgot. That's huge. He says this person isn't, isn't evil. This person isn't, the problem isn't deep-seated wickedness. It's not rebellion. It's not, I, I refuse to change. He just says, what? Two words. What are they? I, I, I forgot. He says, we walk away and we just, just forget. This, this, my friends, is huge. This is huge. So let's, let's play hardball for a moment. Okay. How many of you remember, if you've been around for months and months, how many of you remember a series we did back in January, February called The Grace Effect? Anybody? Anybody here for that series? It was a series, on, Grace Effect is kind of like when you become the recipient of grace, you should become a conduit of grace. It's kind of like grace, God's grace in my graciousness out. And one of the first messages was on the gift of hospitality. Uh, hospitality is a lover of strangers. And this is an image that we used, image of a bonfire or a campfire. And it was a story from the Apostle Paul. He gets shipwrecked, literally washes up on shore of some island and it's raining and it is cold out. And I hear all these people who've just washed up on shore and it says the villagers living on the island, because it was cold and rainy, it said they built a fire and welcomed them to the island so they could have some warmth. And I said, okay, what if this is the image of hospitality? When someone washes up on the shore of your life, build a fire. When someone wash, and it's different in a school, different in a company, different when someone moves into your neighborhood, but when someone washes up on the shore of your life, build a fire. And so, you go, oh, I remember that. Cool. What did you do with it? I, I forgot, I forgot. It's possible, oh, you know, I was gonna, it's just, I've, you get busy. Between the parking lot of a church and a driveway of a house is an incredible opportunity just to forget, but then you get rolling into to work stuff, email stuff, graduation open house stuff, relative getting married stuff. We get busy and we, one word, we, Forget. Uh, we talked about um, we talked about the gift of forgiveness. It's just talking about how lethal it is to carry long-term grudges without letting people grow. It can turn us a dark shade of bitter. And some of you are under deep conviction. Oh my goodness, I gotta I gotta let go of that. I gotta let go of that. I gotta release that person. I go. Did you? Not yet. And the two-word response could simply be what I what I I forgot. We talked about. In this series of Grace Effect, we talked about financial generosity. And I gave the, I melted it down to the simplest formula I could possibly come up with, which is just know and grow. If you desire to grow in financial generosity, that is the money that you don't spend on you, here's a twofold plan. Know what you did last year and bump it up a little bit. Know and grow. And right about now, there are some husbands and wives kind of going like, we were gonna do that but just do a baseline evaluation and then bump that. And you do that enough times, you see magnificent growth over time, no one grow. And many would say, you know something, we were going to do, and many of you, dozens and dozens of you did that and just applause there. But some of you just simply, what? Forgot. So James says, it's like the person, man looks himself in a mirror, walks away and he just forgets what he saw. This is so powerful because the enemy here seems to be forgetfulness. It's not rebellion, resistance. Like I wanted to change. I just never got around to it because I was forgetful. So see where James turns next. He writes this. Um, he goes, uh, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. He says, listen, you will find this so freeing in your life. We think the laws constrain and restrict. Often laws liberate, all right? Law that gives freedom and, word here, what, and what, and? Continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but actually doing something with it. They will be blessed in what they do. The blessing is not in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing. They will be blessed in all they do. And so the, it's interesting. He says, uh, continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. The opposite of forgetting is not remembering. Remembering is not the opposite of forgetting. In this section, forgetting, the opposite is doing. You remember so that you can activate something in your life. So uh, let me use an image that I hope 
sticks with you, all right? Because my sense is that those of you who have experienced radical change in an area of life did not experience radical change because you heard something and it like transformed immediately, overnight, instant fix. It was because you were able to take a swing at something again and again and again and again, what James calls continues in it. What does it mean to explore something and then to continue in it, to stick with it and to let it stick with you? So the image is this. I don't know how many of you have been to a graduation open house lately that had a tent set up in the backyard in the driveway or a wedding reception where there was a, a tent set up. And so a, a tent like that, you know, you have, the, you have the canvas, right? And then you have the poles set up. But then there are the guidelines and the stakes uh, that give support and stability to an outside tent like that. Now, if you ever see someone uh, drive one of those stakes in, it's like, you know, they put it in place and they strike it. That'll do it. No, it's never gonna stick, right? So they hit it again, and they hit it again, and they hit it again, and they, they take another swing at it. And what I wanna suggest to you is that if you desire to experience massive forward movement, in an area of spiritual endeavor in your life, it will probably require taking another swing at it and another swing at it and another swing at it and another swing at it. This, my friends, is how growth most normally happens. There may be a compelling sermon that shakes you, rattles you, motivates you, and sends you forward, but the change occurs as you repeat that truth in your heart and in your behavior again and again and again, and again, you take another swing at it. And some of you are going like, well, Jeff, what the church needs to do is you guys need to create some kind of memory tool so that this sticks in our mind and it doesn't get lost along the way. I'm so glad you thought of that. <laughs> we have a strategy <laughs> that's called the row, the circle, and the chair. And the chair, one of the tools we've created, five daily devotionals that you receive in your inbox, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, that pull you back to the teaching on the weekend. It's called, not there, but it's called, any of you know what we call this tool? It's called Beyond the Weekend. For our purposes today, you know what you can call that tool? After the sermon. We don't do that. We don't write those for our health. We write those for yours because we respect what can evaporate in your mind between the church parking lot and your driveway. And so we created Beyond the Weekend so that a person that's interested in a growth track can just go, to actually take something they hear on the weekend and make it actionable throughout the week. But it's gonna require taking another swing at it so it just doesn't get lost, so I don't forget. The, 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 the circle, our, our small group ministry, uh, we write discussion questions based on the sermon. And even those who are going through a different curriculum, a specialized curriculum, available to our small group leaders are, listen, Perhaps begin your group by asking these two questions, these three questions that take us back to what we all heard together last weekend because we respect how rapidly stuff gets lost. We respect how rapidly it's forgotten. We respect, you listen, I know that they talked about forgiveness, but how in the world do I forgive my dad for? And all of a sudden you can process that with a group of people who can listen and perhaps advise on how to take something that you've heard and actually put it into action. 35, 30, 35 years of serving this church, radical change in some people's lives, not a lot of change. You kind of go, what? My goodness, what's up with that? Why is it that some people are so transformed by the power of Christ and other people just seem the same month after month and year after year? Does it have to do anything with individuals who hear a, hear a teaching and walk away and forget versus those who circle back to it. Take another swing at it. Take another swing at it. Take another swing at it. I guess what I'm saying is, is that transformational growth doesn't just happen 
to some people and not happen to others. You have something to do, a lot to do with whether or not you grow in your faith. So the matter at hand, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. A dude hears that today. And when I gave the, you didn't make him angry, he was angry, some of you went, I'm that driver. And when I walk into my house, I'm like at a 9.5 and my kids, they don't have to do anything before I go off on them. And so uh, in an attempt to take another swing at it, guy writes up a little card. It says nine words and a number. Nine words, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and a number. It is unfair for me to walk into meetings and to walk into my home at an eight. It's just unfair to the people around me. Nine words and a number. But he takes the little three by five card and he puts it near his tra travel mug that he carries to the work site every day or to the plant every day or to the office every day. And as he's making coffee, he just go, okay, there we go. Quick to, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. As he parks in a parking spot, he's made it a discipline to go, <sighs> quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. As he pulls into his driveway at the end of the day, and there is the grass 16 inches high, the grass that was to have been mowed. And there is the bicycle sitting in the middle of the lawn. How many times have I told him to put his bike in the garage? Just that moment where he goes, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. It was okay, I need to have a conversation. A little more light and a little less heat. A little more light and a little less. Intercept this guy three years later. It's like, dude, you've changed. He goes, yeah, nine words and a number. Nine words and a number. But I had to come back to it again and again, and again, and again. You need to continue. You stick with it, and you allow it to stick with you. And over time, God transforms. The grace of God transforms and reshapes your heart. Okay, Jeff, awesome. I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I get it. Can we move on, please? No. I want to move on. James won't move on. So part one of the conversation, how we relate, part two of the conversation after, after the uh, sermon, part three of the conversation, how we relate. We already talked about that. I know, he wants to talk about it again. And he does, so here we go. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Oh, this is about speech. No, it's about relationships because as goes the conversation, so goes the relationship. He who considers himself religious and does not keep a tight a tight what? A tight rain, rain. Uh, what kind of language, what kind of imagery does that sound like to you? A tight rain. What, is that, what does that sound like to you? Equestrian? Does that sound equestrian, anybody? Uh, reins, along with a bit, is a steering mechanism. It's a mechanism of, of control. I don't know how many of you would set your second grader up on a horse with absolutely no reins, just a saddle, hang on to the pommel, and say, you know, just kick it and see what happens. Uh, absolutely powerful and absolutely out of control. And James goes, yeah, yeah, don't, don't, yeah, don't let that be you. Well, Jeff, I always thought, you know, if you're thinking it, you might as well say it. Bad idea. There's all kinds of things that might enter our mind and we just go, yeah, tight. Notice how extreme his language is. He says, anyone that considers himself a religious person, yeah, I go to mass, uh, I go to church, we volunteer over there, uh, and yet doesn't keep a rein on their mouth. He says, you're self-deceived, and that kind of religion is worthless. He's talking here about what we restrain, and you go, there's got to be more to it than that. And he goes, there is. There's not only what we restrain, there's what we release. And what he begins to now turn the attention to is releasing compassion, releasing compassion. It's what we restrain and it's what we 
release. Check this out, very next verse. He says, religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless. If there's a worthless religion, you go, yeah, well, okay, but what's the opposite of worthless religion? He says, okay, religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, I wanted to focus on that center statement right there real quick, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress. Again, look through this, not through our century and through our country. Try to look at this through Eastern culture. There's no social security program. There's no pension program set up. There's no life insurance, uh, life expectancy was significantly shorter. And so when you talk about orphans and widows, you talk about people who are thrown into a distressful situation, thrown into a traumatic situation, not to their own making. These two little kids, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, they didn't decide for their parents to die. This woman who's recently widowed, she didn't decide for her husband to die. This is a situation largely of their own doing, and they're thrown into a traumatic, uh, they are traumatized and uh, destabilized. And it says in their distress, this is someone in your life that's going through massive stress. And so just, where would he get that? No, 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 this is what pure religion looks like. It's to care for distressed people in your world, people who are traumatized and destabilized, to to, to look after them. Go, why? Back to Psalm 68 and dozens of other passages, like it talks about God, father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows, is God in his holy dwelling. (sighs) There's something in the heart of God When someone is thrown into a traumatic life situation, there's something in the heart of God that is deeply concerned by that. And so here when it says pure religion before God our Father is this, to look after the orphans and the the widows, it's kind of like, will my heart beat with God's heart for those going through trauma, those who are destabilized by a situation in life. And this might not be exclusively a widow or an orphan. There's all kinds of destabilization that takes place, all kinds of trauma that takes place. This might be in your world looking out for, looking out for anybody who has lost a child, anybody who is losing a marriage, anybody who is in the process of losing a career, and right now they're just lost a bit traumatized, and life has been really destabilized. And the word we have here is, if you want a religion that God goes, yes, step toward that and step into that. The question I have for you is just a question, who are you looking out for? The needs of the world are so overwhelming so many disasters, so much uh, uh, poverty, you know, refugee situations. It's, like, it, it's, it's, it's staggering and you just get overwhelmed by it. We'll do this, just say, at any time in my life, when someone says, who are you looking out for? I should be able to respond, oh, right now, I'm looking out for him. I'm looking out for her. We're looking out for them. That four-year-old, that fourth grader that plays on your kid's baseball team and his dad just bailed and moved to Tennessee and the kid hasn't seen him for three months, be able to say right now, destabilized, destabilized and traumatized right now, I'm looking out for him. Our youth group volunteers who say right now there is a sixth grade girl, a sophomore girl who is spiraling into depression and can't seem to get out of it. Look, I might have uh, eight or a dozen uh, girls in my small group right now I'm looking out for her. This is those of you who say, I have an elderly neighbor and all of their children live far away from uh, Grand Rapids area. Uh, I'm gonna check up once a week, once a week, once a week, once a week with holy redundancy, with repetition. Who are you looking out for? I'm looking out. I'm looking out for her. I'm looking out for him. We're looking out for them. Who are you looking out for? My friends, do you realize the difference that this begins to make in your heart? There is something about our culture where the gravitational pull is just to go, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. This verse about how we relate and how our eyes are open to the traumatized and the destabilized. If you begin to act on this, it will train the channels of the heart to go, it's not all about me, it's not all about me, it's not all about me. This can change you. 
The grace of Christ can change you here as you practice this. But the blessing is in the doing, not in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing, not in the knowing. Thirty-five years uh, and going in marriage and ministry, and I am absolutely delighted to witness the stories that we've seen of the radical change that Jesus makes in people's lives. Sometimes, and we can be puzzled by saying, "Why does it happen here, and why doesn't it happen here?" Uh, James has just given us some clues as to why we change and why we don't, as to why we move, and as to why we get stuck. Any of you, uh, any of you watch the Godfather movies back in the day? Confess. Michael Corleone, right? Michael Corleone, Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Godfather 3. Uh, third, third Godfather movie. I know this goes back uh, quite a ways. Uh, Michael Corleone, mafia boss, believes that he has been scammed by the church. And there's, there's a scandal. And so he seeks out, uh, he seeks out a wise cardinal, uh, Cardinal Lamberti. And there's this conversation that takes place beside a well where after hearing this story and what's transpired, Cardinal Lamberti reaches into a well filled with water and he pulls out a single stone. And he says to Michael Corleone, he says, this this stone has been in the water for a long time. It has been immersed in the water. And he takes the stone and he hits it against the stone fountain and breaks it in half. And then he shows it to Corleone. And he says, but look, it's perfectly dry on the inside. Perfectly dry. And then he said, men in Europe have been surrounded by Christianity for hundreds of years. But Christ hasn't penetrated them. Christ doesn't breathe in them. And I love that image because for us, who live in wonderful Grand Rapids, Michigan, there is this possibility to be immersed in all things church. Hear the scriptures taught, and yet it's just not getting inside. Christ isn't breathing in us. My plea is simple. Don't let that be you. I hope that's not you. I hope that's not me. I hope that's not us. Today, if you are in a season where you're growing, just hear what James wrote is just an impulse. Just keep moving, keep moving. Hear the applause of your heavenly father over your life, not because of your perfection, but because of your direction. Keep moving, keep moving. And today, if you find yourself as that dry rock inside, if your life has become stale, sterile, and stagnant, could this be a river that begins to work its way and course through your life as you begin to practice day after day after day what you are hearing? Our gracious God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks that we've had this chance to gather and to think and to talk and to act. Please guide us this week as we move into our worlds. We ask this in the name of Jesus who came here for us. Amen. We'll see you next week.